We're taking Olga to visit Bergman Island, and we're finding some men with the Lady of Heaven. I'm Van Connor. And I'm Bex Perfect, and this is Off Screen, your seven day guide to everything movies. Boom. Groovy. Welcome to Off Screen. So last week was the big week with Top Gun Maverick out on your big screens, and it is still dominating. So what we've got for you are some slightly smaller films, but do not be put off by that. They are some really, really solid movies that you can go and see if you want an alternative to that big blockbuster. We are kicking off today with something that is out today. It's rated 15. It is called Olga. Van, over to you. Yeah, so Olga, this is uh, this one ar- arrived almost fortuitously uh, in, in terms of its, its in terms of geopolitical events because this is about a a, gym, a, a, a gymnastic Olympic hopeful um, mm. from the Ukraine. This is set in 2013, so they have to be. You get the impression they've gone in and specifically put the year in, so that you you know you know kind of when this has to be set with certain events. And uh, she is uh, she, this is this young girl, Olga, basically lives through the day-to-day of life in the Ukraine. Her mother is a journalist and we see just what everyday life is like when she, you're attached to anyone in, in the public eye and in that profession and the threats and things that she has to endure, the just almost casual, flippant attempts on her life. Um, she then goes away to, you know, a, a remote training facility, as, as Olympic potentials, you know, tend to do, and is forced to watch from afar as certain political events you may remember at the time, roughly what, eight years ago, start to unfold in the Ukraine. And it's whether or not she can step forward, with, take a stand and have a voice, use her platform. But at the same time, how it starts to affect her mindset, where she is, what kind of student she wants to be. How does she want to, to function in relation to her homeland? So there's, there's a lot of layers to it that only seem to have been deepened since mm. obvious events. Yeah, and you didn't, you didn't yeah. have the pleasure of seeing this one, did you? I didn't, but I did do a little bit. I did a little bit of light reading on it, and I, you know, my first impression was I thought, oh, I'll watch this. It's a documentary, and then it, it's not I a thought, documentary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you had the yeah, same, exactly right? The same. I thought documentary from how it was described to me, because otherwise I thought, well, what are the odds of just getting this story? And she happens to be Ukraine at this exact moment, because I would imagine that you know the Ukrainian film industry might be taking something of a pause at the moment, yeah. to say the least. So I would imagine that being the case. So I would have just assumed documentary, but no, it just mm. turns out fortuitous filmmaking in this case. Um, Ellie Grapp directing, and it's directed with a sort of uh, kind of. I don't want to say uh, cold intensity. This is something that's going to come up. I'm going to, I'm going to, say, I'm going to use these, this exact description in an inverse way later on. But um, something of a, of, of a cold intensity. Something like, it's gripping, but in a very clammy way. You know, where you can, where you can actually see up close how clammy someone is in the tension of the moment. You get what I'm yeah. saying with that. But at the same time, it's, it's not kind of voyeuristic in that way either. It does still feel like we are watching quite a thoughtfully put together movie. I thought that was great, actually. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Because I think, you know, I think some people might be put off initially just by the fact that they thought mm. they might be watching some sort of documentary. They get into it. It's a foreign movie, of course. Do we see a lot of gymnastics or is it a lot of talking about gymnastics? That's the next question, isn't it? <laughs> I will say, I will say, I'm, try, I'm trying to pronounce her full name. It's uh, Anastasia, and I cannot, hang on one second, I'm going to pull it up. Anastasia Budjaskina, I think her name is. Right, now, she would appear to at least be somewhat professionally trained. Otherwise, she's got a hell of a knack for it. There's a lot of gymnastics in this, and mm. they are simply breathtaking. And we're talking about long, unbroken takes that are quite well choreographed, quite well executed. And they they you know they land to applause, literally. Um, she's fantastic in the role. Like I say, working very very clearly a well-directed performance because it's perfectly in lock and step with what the aesthetic sensibility and what the tone and what the atmosphere of this is quite clearly pivoted and meant to be. But mm. great performer. Like I hope, I, I hope she gets the Leia Sadu effect. I hope she just carries through to, you know, a billion more mainstream Western studio movies, whether it makes sense that she's there or not, because I would very much enjoy seeing more of her. I think she's great. Fantastic. Okay, so that is Olga. As mentioned, it's rated 15. It's out in cinemas mm. from today. And if you're into gymnastics, sounds like definitely one for you. Now, if you are into the movies of Ingmar Bergman, uh, you might, if... 
big if. if. Yeah, um, big if. You might be tempted um, by this next movie, which is also rated 15. It's called Bergman Island. It stars Tim Roth and also Mia Wasikowska as well, uh, who comes into this movie, probably in its second half. Mm. Um, and it's the story of... Um, Two screenwriters, two mm. partners and screenwriters, who yeah. go to this island in Sweden, uh, which is dedicated to Ingmar Bergman and everything that where he shot some of his very famous movies and, you know, where he sits in his chair in his cinematic screening room, all this kind of stuff. And they want to go there to kind of help get inspiration to write their own screenwriters. Now, there's an imbalance between the couple. One is slightly more famous than the other. Um, and as they're in this picturesque escape, um, another movie comes to life and plays out as part of this movie, which is uh, where Tim Ross' partner sort of puts pen to paper and we see Mia Wasikowska play out that secondary role within this. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of a, a description of it. Take an idea from this clip as to the tone and the pace of this movie and it will give you a nice little inkling. Don't you think it's too nice to... To what? Uh... Beautiful. All this calm and perfection. I find it oppressive. Ah, uh, soothing. Yeah, but I didn't realize, you know, writing here, how can I not feel like a loser? I'm even afraid to sit at a desk. Uh, right outside then. A lot of people come here to work. Students, writers, designers. No one's expecting persona. Yeah, well, thank God for that. You know what? I hadn't even heard that clip before we pressed play on that. And I knew that exactly <laughs> what tone and pace it would come out as. I didn't even need to pre-prep it. <laughs> you know what? It, it's bang on. It's completely fair, Bex. I've got to give it to you. Uh, it, it, it's a very kind of monotone. It's very monosyllabic kind of a movie. Oh. Did, and, and the weird part is, like, it's good. When you get there, it's a good movie. But, oh, my God, it makes you work to get there. It's a hell of Doesn't a slog just... to get there. And it's not exactly like it's an overly long movie. It's an hour 52, right? Okay, so it's 112. And you think, okay, 112, that set up. Tim Roth, Vicky Creeps, are you here in the, the clip as well from Phantom Thread? Is his partner. Um, and obviously Mia, Mia Wasikowska, obviously, they're kind of the three names on the poster here. So you would expect, and Mia Hansen love uh, writing and directing. She's kind of a, a, a buzzy name. I expected a lot more from this. What I got was an assignment. I feel like that's <laughs> the best way to describe it. Like, I was just sat there clinging to this, thinking, yeah, this is an interesting story and you are an interesting character, but none of this is interestingly, like, executed it's a story yeah, it about passion that lacks any passion, passion. <laughs> yeah. It seems like there's a yeah there's like a moment where um uh sorry what was the name of the the co uh, of, of his Vicky, partner Vicky, 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 creeps. Vicky, Vicky creeps. creeps i'm, I'm calling so her creeps she, i think it's pronounced creeps yeah, so she goes far, She goes through Tim Roth's kind of writing notebooks and then discovers this kind of sadomasochistic, uh, yeah. like, drawings and writings, and you think, oh, something steamy might happen here, but nothing yeah. happens. Yeah, and it's I mean, just I, kind of like, what, yeah. what's the point? <laughs> I got to that point as well, and I was like, oi, oi, things are looking up. Okay, Tim, yeah. what you got for me, baby? Come on. And then, no, nothing. Um, it, like I it's say... Plastered. It's placid. It's placid. That's all I could say about this movie. It's going to really appeal to a certain subset of the audience, if we're being honest. And we know exactly who that subset of the audience is, and we know exactly what item of clothing they all have in common. Um, usually has a couple of buttons, some sleeves, occasionally some tweed on the, on the elbows. But, uh, yeah, aside out of, even within those remits, fine. And, yes, it, you do, if, you could, if you're willing to work for it, if you're willing to, to put it in, you can, you can get a decent movie out of it, but... Good God, you don't have to work to get there. Like I say, so it's called Bergman Island. It's up to you whether or not you want to take the trip. I would say think it through.
Welcome back to Off Screen. So if you didn't want to take a trip to Bergman Island, then don't worry, we can still keep you in the cinema with some other things that are out this week. Namely, the first movie on our second block is The Lady of Heaven. Now, this is rated 15 in cinemas again from today. I'm just going to just gonna say, Bex, when you said, you know, if you didn't fancy a visit to Bergman Island, we're going to take you to, I honestly thought that was going to get followed <laughs> up by dot, 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 Iraq. So <laughs> thank you for that. Well, yeah. Well, seeing that... <laughs> you mentioned Iraq we're going we are actually going to Baghdad and we're going to um to a quite a harrowing tale of where the uh, where ISIS basically invade Baghdad and a mother and her son are followed by some uh soldiers from um, from ISIS and um she is is shot and killed and the son is then taken to hospital and he ends up living with a family of a soldier who is fighting against ISIS. And to help him through this horrible scenario that is going on in this invasion, the grandmother who is living in the house tells him the story of um, the Lady Fatima. And this is like a, almost like a biblical story, essentially, um, a tale of old, which is inter interwoven with key moral points that come in and, and find themselves crossing over with what is happening within the real life and what we can learn from those lessons of yesteryear. Did your mother ever tell you the story of the Lady of Heaven? She was very special. Daughter to the Prophet Muhammad. Lady Fatima's goodness inspired people to stand up, no matter what the cost. Her legacy lives on. So you'd be forgiven for thinking that that trailer's a bit kind of like Gladiator or something like that along those lines. <laughs> yeah. But let me tell you, like the first, so you've got this kind of juxtaposition of, of the way it's, it's filmed. Um, at the very beginning, you're watching the whole kind of modern day scenario take place and you <laughs> you forget, well, you don't expect maybe that they're kind of British actors playing these roles. So that was a bit hmm. odd to start off with. And then suddenly you've got like kids with quite London based accents, uh, you know, playing these particular roles. It's quite jarring, um, isn't it? It is jarring, yeah. And then you've got this kind of gray, gray color grading that's happening, which feels a little bit amateur. You've got the most God awful news um, news reports that are happening that look so budget. I, and I I was like, is this a student film that Van has roped me into? But before I say, before I kind of shut it down, because I don't, I just want to say that's like your first like 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. When they go into the story of the Lady Fatima and they go back in time. And the reason why I kind of mentioned the word biblical is because when you watch like biblical movies, like Jesus of Nazareth, things like that, there is a feel to them and they've managed to capture that feel in the production yeah. and the scale in what they're doing. But you do feel like you're in a bit of a religious studies lesson whilst watching this movie is the way I kind of felt about it. I can I can understand that. And, and don't get me wrong, it's, it's a cut above most faith-based yeah. movies that we've reviewed, especially lately. I mean, good Lord, this is, this is, this is light years above Father Stu starring Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, it has some fundamental problems. I don't want to get into the politics mm. of it. Not my place. Um, no. I mean, I lived in Kuwait for a decade, but it's still not my place. But uh, it, there are issues out there. Just go and yeah. you can go on Twitter and, and there are enough, uh, you know, more informed opinions on, on the, the politics of this, which do seem to be quite problematic. Although if you want a, a much more simplified version that is there on screen to behold, the movie does begin with a statement of intent that, you know, it deplores violence. This movie is not meant to, to glorify violence followed by two hours and 21 minutes of glorifying violence. Yeah. So there is that to consider. Um, it is yeah. written but there's, by... a, there's a modern story behind this, you know, the yes. whole kind of parallel, the Lady yeah. Fatima, she's standing up against her oppressors, mm. all that kind of stuff. We yeah, do, but you do get that. But, when, but when, yeah. when there's a scrap to be had, they do properly this go is for it. This, is, this yeah. is from the school of aspiring Zack Snyder's as far as the action department goes. Let's yes. be honest. Because every single person who worked on the action scenes for this is a 300 fan. Let's just say that. You know that straight off the bat. <laughs> everybody, in, 
everybody in that edit suite, in that CG studio, and in, in the action choreographing warehouse or whatever it was, every single person was a fan of Troy. Let's just, you know what I mean? Like, we know what the movies are that these guys love because yeah. it's right there on screen. And again, movie to start with. Um, it's written by Sheikh Al Habib, who is a Shia cleric. And a big deal has been made out of that fact, um, like in the promotion of it. Like, you know, Sheikh Al Habib, actual informed cleric, a Muslim, you know, a cleric has, you know, you know written this. You think. Yeah, but you know what? After two hours and 21 minutes, my takeaway from that is perhaps, maybe, just maybe, you might have been better off hiring a screenwriter. Anyway, it's called The Lady of Heaven. It goes on for an agonizing two hours and 21 minutes. It's not particularly that good. Decently enough, maybe, though. Um, If you're into that kind of thing, go nuts. If you want sort of Islamic epic gladiator with a lot of preaching. Yes. Kind of, but, but aimed at sort of the director video crowd. This is where yeah. we're at. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Now, yeah. next up, we've got something which I saw a trailer for uh, when I was watching. What is that? What was that Viking movie with Alexander? Oh, Skarsgård Northman. Recently? Northman. Northman. Yeah. So this Northman. Really, this was yes. So this led into watching Northman, and I watched, and it's called Men, and mm. it's rated fifteen, which I'm surprised at because the trailer would suggest it should be an eighteen. <laughs> My husband turned to me and went, "Not for me." <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and I was like, yeah, this probably isn't one for you. But Jesse Buckley looks pretty scary. You caught it. What are your thoughts on this? So Jesse Buckley is, uh, you know, she, let's just call, can we start calling her Dame Jesse Buckley now and just save ourselves yeah. the 20 years yeah. of waiting? Because that's clearly where this is all going. You know, it's going to be Dame Olivia Coleman, Dame, Dame Jesse Buckley. We know the future dames. Let's just cut out the middleman. Let Queenie do them while she's around. Come on. Anyway, um, so Jesse Buckley is the young widow who's, uh, whose husband has recently committed suicide. She is trying, she's working through her grief and she, she decides to basically Airbnb a cottage, you know, a remote cottage that's like a four hour drive from London. She sets out, she meets the groundskeeper who looks after, you know, who's, like he owns the, the house, he looks after, he just rents it out, doesn't live there. And he's played by, um, uh, what's his name, Rory, this is going to kill me now, Rory Kinnear. Uh, Rory Kinnear. Rory Kinnear, yeah. Oh, God. I, I was almost going to say, because there's so many Rory's, isn't there now? But I always said Rory Cochran. I was like, why would Rory Cochran from CSI Miami be in an Alex Garland movie? But okay. Uh, Rory Kinnear. Different Rory. Very different Rory. Um, and then, sorry, and then my brain went Greg Kinnear. Beside the point. Rory Kinnear is the groundskeeper. He's in full League of Gentlemen mode. And he's, oh, you'll hear him in the, you might hear him in the clip. Yeah, <laughs> you know, very much, clearly, clearly a Brexit voter. And he automatically sets her on edge because there's something not quite right about him. He leaves her in peace, live in the house, and before you know it, strange things start happening. And a strange, seemingly not quite with it, elderly man appears naked in the garden, played by Rory Kinnear. And then she goes into the town to a pub that's run by this guy who looks like Rory Kinnear. And to the local church where she, she sits on a step and she's taunted by a little boy who looks like Rory Kinnear and gets Ugh. chatting to a priest who looks like Rory Kinnear. You know that saying, not all men. Mm. That is literally where the title of this movie comes from, but it turns out, yes, all Rory Kinnears. You're tormented. It feels more like... Haunted. Yeah. Something happened. My husband went upstairs to our balcony. And let himself go. You must wonder why you drove him to it. Why well, I, I didn't drive him to it. I thought it'd be true. But if you had given him the chance to apologize, he'd still be alive. What? Uh, the concept of this kind of freaks me out, sends a bit of shivers mm -hmm. down my spine. I feel a bit like it's like being John Malkovich, the scene where it's just many, many Malkoviches. <laughs> and it's just like, and we haven't seen something like that for quite some time. I'm not sure I can sit through something like this. It sounds like it's going to really creep me out and it's too much of a thinker. 
Um, what kind of it, horror fan is into this, would you say? Like, it is going to be... It, I mean, it has that A24 feel to it. It's not mm. an A24 film, I don't believe, but it has that A24 kind of... In fact, no, it is an A24 movie, I think, actually, isn't it? Um, but it's Alex Garland. So you know yeah. that this is going to come with a certain level of very obvious intellect behind the writing. I mean, Alex Garland's never been accused of sloppy or, or, or dumb writing, to be honest. Um, I will say that this falls into the more abstract camp of his work, because obviously you and I are both fans of Ex Machina, and going back to his you know, his work on things like The Beach and things like that, and, you know, he's inputting things like Judge Dredd, he has a certain sensibility to his writing. And Annihilation, a few years ago with Natalie Portman, showed that he was, he was willing to push in a bit more of an abstract direction. This, I think, takes it all the way there. Um, the subject matter of it, though, does kind of just does work in inducing something of a more personal chill to it, and it does have an effectiveness, particularly with Jesse Buckley's performance. It is going to chill a lot of people. This is going to work as a straight horror movie, but I think it's going to be more warmly embraced by the so-called, I hate saying it, elevated horror crowd instead. Welcome back to Off Screen. Now, moving from the big screen onto the small screen for you, we are taking on a wild ride of your seven days of top movies on your telly box. And we are kicking off with what is available today. One of my favourite films. I absolutely love this. 10.45 p.m. on BBC Two is Pride. Now, this is the story of UK gay activists who work to help during the miners' strike um, of the National Union of Mine Workers in the summer of 1984. So they really help to support them. It is a wonderful, feel-good, mm. brilliant, brilliantly British movie and it's something that I think a lot of people will learn about the 1984 sort of miners strike and how that mm. affected the kind of you know LGBTQ community and also it just gives you that feeling of brassed off doesn't it it's fantastic all aboard the deviants bus no pushing no community singing oh, and absolutely no back chatting the driver right where are we going Wales someone better run their little split head what I'd like to know is what Bromley sold his mum and dad. Yeah. I just... That's no big deal. <laughs> Come on. I said that I was doing so well at college they were sending me on a residential course. Doing what? Shoe pastry. <laughs> <laughs> First movie I ever remember seeing uh, George Mackay in, and then when I eventually mm. got to meet him and I didn't know his name, I just freaked out. Went Bromley! Um, <laughs> such a great movie. Pride, uh, yeah. ten forty-five tonight, so Friday night on uh, BBC Two, and it's it's one of those. It, it really it warms the heart. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll feel anger, you'll feel joy, you will feel the full emo emotional spectrum. I mean, Bill Nye kills him. This Dominic West, you heard in the clip, being just charming, charming mm. as hell. In that way, that only Dominic West can, darling. You know, oh God, I love that man. But uh, onto something a bit more, uh, a bit more brat backy for uh, for yes. Saturday night, though. Uh, though Bex, it's we're going down in a blaze of glory with a second round of Young Guns. What what time and channel is this on? I haven't got my paperwork up for. Ah, oh, this is uh, four forty-five p.m. on Paramount, and mm. um, this is the one that I think. When we've talked about Blaze of Glory before, I've kind of gone, this is the one with Bon Jovi, right? No, this is, this yeah, is this the is, one this with is, Bon Jovi. Yeah, yeah. 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 This, this, the <laughs> yeah. legend goes, the legend goes that they approached him to do a song in a diner and he literally wrote the, the lyrics to Blaze of Glory on the napkin in the diner during that actual meeting. Like they just had lunch. That's how the legend goes. Um, this is certainly the stronger of the two films. It's the blockbuster mm. one of the two films. The yeah. first one felt like a lot smaller scale, basic or Western. Um, this one, you don't need to have seen the first one to see the second one. The first one kind of is, is part of the origin story for Billy the Kid. This one is about the legend of Billy the Kid. But you don't really need to have had the origin to get there. Uh, so Emilio Estevez is the old man and the young man in this iteration who narrates, who sort of bookends the narrative story mm. of the legend, the rise, and eventually the fall of Billy the Kid at the hands of his former friend, Pat Garrett, who becomes a sheriff and is played here, and we all like to forget this one, by none other than Gil Grissom himself, William Peterson. William Peterson's the man that went after Billy the Kid. It's something yeah, we all tend crazy. to forget, but great movie, lots of fun, still holds up. 
Yeah, definitely holds up. And another movie that really holds up and is probably my favourite Wes Anderson movie mm. of the collection is available for you guys at 9pm on Great Movies and that is The Grand Budapest Hotel. This for Oof. me is your chocolate box, chocolate box Wes Anderson movie. It's the one that mm. you kind of, if you've struggled with his movies previously, this is kind of the most commercially viable of his movies as well. It kind of brings a wider audience in. It proves the point that Ray Fiennes really should do more comedy. And yes. of course, it's got its fantastic cast, uh, Tilda Swinton, Saoirse Ronan's in it. Um, it's just so much fun. Oh, it really is. It's got a lot of that Peter Sellers-ish energy yes. to it. Like, you do think back to old school pieces. And it's very obvious that Wes Anderson has, you know, it's obvious through all of his work that Wes Anderson has a hearkening, you know, for that era of cinema and that kind of comedy. And it's, it's you know, it, it, he and Ray Fine seem on the same page with that. Like, it's, it's a very much mm. a Peter Sellers-ish performance from Ray Fine, which yeah. he does amazingly. Because I think, didn't he have this and Hail Caesar around the same time? So we got, like, double, yeah, he did. double yeah, dose of did. hilarious fun. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. But so I do, I, I do use, I do use this movie t when I look at newer Wes Anderson movies to kind of get pit. Uh, like this is the benchmark for me. This is mm. the one. Like, how good is it against the Grand Budapest Hotel? So if you haven't seen it, it is great yeah. and it's definitely worth your time. It's out at 9 p.m. on Great Movies uh, this Sunday. So 9 p.m. on Monday on is it this one's film four film four film four, yeah. film four. we've got uh, one of my favorite movies of the last few years and uh, what I was so right about they they wound up dropping half a billion dollars to make two sequels to it that's how damn right I turned out to be it was a little film called Knives Out yeah you know Oscar nominated Knives Out. Starring Daniel Craig as the hilariously foghorn leghorn accented detective Benoit Blanc, who directs just a sort of modern Agatha Christie story. That's all it is. It's an all-star cast doing Agatha Christie story, but just an original work. That's all it is. Let's let's do the same kind of thing. Let's just get our get all our famous mates to show up, see if we can get oh Don Johnson's free, he can come down and be the husband. Oh, Michael Shannon's free, he can be the bitter, jilted brother, and oh, oh we've got to we've we've got Crystal Plummer, he can be the he's the, he can be the guy, yes. Oh, Anna Diarmas, you say. It's a bonkers movie when you when you look at that cast, but it's just a damn good murder mystery. It'll really keep you yeah. guessing. And it's it's quite clever in that it is a murder mystery that kind of solves its own actual murder element kind of straight off the bat, but then still manages to keep you guessing. Like there are yeah. so many twists and turns to this. I loved it. Uh, my fiance yeah. has uh, has issues with the plot. As as a, as a former ICU nurse, has issues with uh, the use of medication in the plot. Apparently, it doesn't make a lick <laughs> of sense to her, which I had to hear about for the entire duration of this movie when I made her watch it. But uh, alas, well, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Nine o'clock. What I would say. Mind out. Yeah, and I would say to any of our wonderful listeners who are part of the Grey Pound, uh, where you would normally <laughs> go and and watch Death on the Nile or Murder on the Orient Express swap that for this oh yes and i think you'll you'll feel like a new lease of life uh, by watching this movie same same but different is what i'd suggest so next up we've got on tuesday uh 6 25 on uh film four we have only the brave van do you want to take us through this yeah only the brave this one right there's a there's a fictional movie in entourage in the uh, in the uh, series entourage that they pitched to uh the, the vincent chase character and this would appear to be the actual version of that movie it's from uh, 2017 it's directed by uh joseph kaczynski who of course is currently riding high as the director of the literally record setting Top Gun Maverick. This was one of his, mm. I think this was his first pop project post Oblivion, where he, you know, first worked with Tom Cruise and then got the Top Gun job. Uh, this stars Josh Brolin, Miles Teller, Jeff Bridges, amongst an all star cast of uh, smoke jumpers, effectively, firemen who are called into what was one of the most deadly wildfires on record. And it's about their lives leading up to this great tragedy. It's one of those movies that's kind of like Deepwater Horizon. We kind of know the outcome, we kind of know what's going to happen, but it is about the grit of a allowing these actors to just go and give it the dramatization. Let's go, Bravo! Let's go, Bravo! Kick it off, max level! Doors, pop quiz. You're cutting the line on the side hill below the fire. Debris and logs can start to roll down across your line. What do you do? Move the cup trench. Move the logs so they're up and down the slope. There it is. Outstanding. And McDonough, pop quiz. What's your 11th watch out? No, don't look at him. Look at me. What's your 11th watch out? The fire liner. Cotton hasn't been anchored. Boom, that's eight. Uh, you're getting spot fires across that's the- That's 16. Alpha squad, hold. What's your 11th watch out? 
Offer fuel between you and the fire. Firefighters died for us. We could learn all these washouts. If you get another one wrong, I will choke you out. Yeah! Wow. I love this movie. Uh, incidentally, I've just remembered the uh, the looking uh, looking at the cast list, and it's just come to me. They were the Granite Mountain Hotshots, I believe, were the, the fire troop. The cast, just just sample some of this cast, because a lot of them do come back, actually, weirdly, for Top Gun. Uh, so, Josh Brolin, Miles Teller, Jeff Bridges, Jennifer Connelly, James Bashdale, Taylor Kitsch, Andy McDowell, Jeff Stoltz, Thad Luckenville, Ben Hardy. That's an insane roster, and that's before you get to the that guy's from that thing. Like, that's... <laughs> A hell of a look. Yeah. Wow, Jennifer Connelly That's a hell as of a well. cast. But it was a big deal in IMAX at the time. It was quite a big uh, spectacle drive. But 625, uh, Only the Brave. It is one that you can sort of watch with the whole family. It's, it's sort of towering inferno level disaster movie as opposed to sort of, you know, grit and gristle disaster movie. And it does work. And Josh Brolin's always fun as the, you know, the surly Sarge, as you can as you can hear in the, the, the clip there. So uh, Wednesday on Paramount. This was the best of bad options, Bex, I, 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 I confess. 9pm, uh, it's a movie that, according to its star, has a title that aptly describes why he did it. It's Ben Affleck in John Woo's Paycheck, in which he is the reverse engineer for hire, that you, you know, corporations hire him to rip off other companies' products. Um, as part of the conditional uh, contract he signs with one of them, which is run by Aaron Eckhart, he is made to sign an agreement that can have his memory erased you know, afterwards. And he's going to do it for, I think, two years. He does two years' work for them, and his memories are raised at that period. And he's just fabulously rich. You know, he goes through with it only to find not only has he not been paid, but now the corporation's out to get him. And he sets out with the aid of Uma Thurman, a reminder, in a John Woo movie, to solve this mystery. Do you imagine how that goes? It's exactly as schlocky as it sounds. Like I say, best of a bad bunch, but it's still Ben Affleck in a John Woo movie in 2003. And like I say, the title you know, describes why he took it by his own admission. So moving on to <laughs> one last one for the week, though, Bex. How do you want to close out Thursday? I think you've got a clip for the next one, whatever it is. Yeah, well, I think the one we've got for closing us out on Thursday is on 9pm at BBC4. It is the Oscar-winning... Judy for uh, for Renee Zellweger, uh, the transformation that she took mm. that that cre- turned her into Dorothy and everything <laughs> in between. And uh, we're looking at a certain point in Judy Garland's life in this movie. It feels this is the type of movie that I would say the movie itself is average it's okay but it's her performance and and that's reflected in the awards you know she got the best actress Mm. award and all this kind of stuff but actually it was not much for the movie so if you're wanting to see a fantastic performance then i would definitely recommend judy Uh, do you need anything or should we dive in you know it's it's really damp in here i don't think rehearsing is a good idea right well i have all your charts are there any changes you might like to make no everything the same is there anything to discuss then Sweetheart, that's up to you. I don't particularly need to discuss anything. Judy, I'm afraid the critics will review opening night. Sure. Of course. It's tomorrow. I'd like to rest. Definitely on Judy Garland form there, but you could also hear in that clip, Jesse Buckley of all people. What are the odds? She's everywhere this week. But that's uh, Judy, which is, I believe, 9 p.m., did you say, on BBC Four? Yeah. That, yes, that's a, I, I think that's a subtle, star, starry performance to close out your week on Freeview. And we're back for one last ride here on off screen, and this is your chance to view. All of the offerings available on streaming and DVD and Blu-ray. And we have got a selection for you kicking off, which is all available on Disney Plus as of today. Now, we talked as well about uh, Pride being available on uh, the telly box on BBC Two at 10.45pm. But if you don't want to watch it at that time of night, you can watch it at your leisure on Disney Mm. Plus. So that's available today. And then we've got an oldie, but a very goodie and a very long movie. (laughs) It is the the one that I think we've all cried to, male, female, wherever you are in the world, you will have watched this, possibly with an interval if you caught it at the cinema like I did. It Uh, is, of course, Titanic. (laughs) Can we just point out as well that both you and I, Bex, are 
are old enough to remember that Titanic was sold on two VHS tapes. That was yes. a, that was a signature thing. Like everyone had that was the one on everyone's VHS shot that had to be oh, double yes. width. Yep. Yeah. Titanic. One side with Kate width. Winslet, one side with Leo DiCaprio. You could see it. Yep. I know. We yep. all had it. <laughs> uh, speaking speaking of Leo, of course, uh, this boy's life is uh, is coming oh. to Disney Plus today as well. One of my favourite films. A, that's a good one, isn't? It? That's what about ninety three? Yeah. I want to say nineteen ninety three for this boy's life. Yeah. Ellen Barkin and Robert De Niro yep. and like just a fantastic performance from all of them about mm. a woman who has a teenage son played by Leonardo DiCaprio in the 1950s and she then meets a new guy played by Robert De Niro who is essentially a very mean mean guy and they go to live with him and mm. it's about their relationship and oh my goodness it is you'll never look at a cup of java in the same way the way it's said <laughs> by Robert De Niro in that movie. weird thing weird thing with that actually is you look at something like this boy's life which is you know a domestic abuse drama mm. and you think you just wouldn't. We just wouldn't release a movie like that today to that much fanfare, and it be remembered in the same way yeah. that we remember this boy's life. Like I don't think that yeah. will happen. You know, fifteen years from now, with a comparative drama today, I don't think would be the case. Um, also, having said that, though, one from the same one from fifteen years ago now that we still how was it fifteen years ago? Oh my Slumdog god! Slumdog Millionaire was what two thousand eight, but wow. it's on Disney Plus from today, so it took. 14, 14 or 15 years, 2009 is 15 years. Yeah. 15 years, and it's, it's on streaming from today. A movie that I'll creep you out even further, one that's 23 years old this year. The Sixth Sense comes to streaming at 23 bloody years. Oh, my God, how old am I? Oh, that's depressing. I yeah, I was I a teenager when that came out. Oh, I'm Crazy, watching that in Deep Blue Sea in the same week. Um, but one that is coming to Disney Plus, and I'm very happy that it is because I want to see this film get more love. And we're, we're going to have a clip for this as well. Yeah. Um, I was shocked that this wasn't more warmly received. It was Gore Verbinski's 2016, 20, 2016, 2017 um, mystery horror thr uh, thriller, centered yeah. kind of in the same kind of tone as Shutter Island had been a few mm. years earlier. This one stars, <laughs> interestingly enough, not Leonardo DiCaprio, but Dane DeHaan. Dane DeHaan, yeah, his <laughs> Dane, doppelganger. Dane, Dane DeHaan. <laughs> The Tesco's own brand, Leonardo DiCaprio, yeah. uh, in the lead. And uh, this is another mystery around a gothic a gothic hospital, in this case, run by the shady doctor Jason Isaacs, during which he encounters Mia Goth, because, of course, Mia Goth is there. Why wouldn't Mia Goth be there? She's all over the posters, incidentally. It does become quite, quite a memorable, uh, iconic bit of poster imagery for this movie. And she feeds into the mystery of why this doctor is... Uh, of the shady, shady goings-on at this creepy-ass hospital. Did it hurt? Can't remember. Better that way. I saw you before. You a patient here? She's just so much younger than everyone else. Director Volma says I'm a special case. What about you? Are you here for the cure? Actually, I was just leaving. No one ever leaves. Mia Goth there with a very recognisable voice in this, and it's it is really it does feel like a real gothic horror that you'll you'll sit through. It's got quite a slow pace to it, but I do think it's quite beguiling within itself. I yeah. do I did really enjoy it, and I'm with you. I wish there was a bit more love for this, but good performances, uh, interesting movie nonetheless. Now let's move straight on to DVD and Blu-ray, and we've got a couple of offerings for you, haven't we, Van? We have so first up is Firebird, which was only on theatrical. Uh, when was I in the, when I was in the states? So we're talking about like five five weeks ago, maybe. And it's mm. about the forbidden romance uh, in the in the Soviet uh, the, the Soviet uh, Air Force between a hotshot pilot and uh, a, a young a younger oh, it's a young young private, I would say. And then this sort yeah. of eventual love triangle that opens up between them and a female secretary. So it sort of becomes broke back Soviet Top Gun. I thought it was yes. really good. I was really, yeah. really good. Like, well done. Like, didn't become quite a sensationalist, I thought, but it was actually quite lean and popcorn-y. And it, it, it worked. It had flow. It had pace. I was invested. I had very likeable performances. I thought it was a really decent one. I would, I, if you're looking yeah. for a DVD Blu-ray, kind of if you're looking for an, an unlikely date movie, 
Um, it is, incidentally, it's, it's done in English. It's not subtitled. If that's something mm. that might put you off, it's like, oh, it's just subtitled. <laughs> Don't be that guy. Just, just you know, pick it up. It's, it's in English. Um, also out, and you will have heard so much more about this one, uh, Licorice Pizza, the latest from Paul yeah. Thomas Anderson. And stop me if you've heard this before, but it is based on some memoirs of growing up in the San Fernando Valley and the first romance you had with that girl that was a few years older from you, so technically it was illegal, and you crossed paths with that one famous guy, and yeah, but it was but it was in the 70s, so you get to do all of it in costume. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? I, he was maybe gonna be my boyfriend. Listen, young lady, you don't bring this idiot to Shabbat dinner here. Listen, Dad, he's an atheist and an actor, and he's famous. But he's Jewish. He was gonna take me out of here, Etsy. Don't you even look at me. Don't you even look at me. You're always oh. looking at me. I what are you doing? I didn't say anything. What are you doing? What are you thinking, huh? I'm Essie. I work for mom and dad. I'm perfect. I'm a real estate agent. Alana doesn't have her life together. Alana brings home stupid boyfriends all the time. I mean... I knew it. I knew that was what you were thinking. You're always thinking things, you thinker. You thinker. You think things. So, I mean, the, 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 the general question before going into the movie is, uh, do, do, you, do you fancy Alana Haim? Because, <laughs> uh, uh, well, the answer, of course, is because, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson does, and he'd, he'd, he'd really, really like to share that with you for a long, <laughs> long, long time. And, and when the movie's done, um, he's going he's gonna to do it in the press, too. He's going to take over all the talk shows, and you're going to have to just stare at the gaping chasm of Lana Haim fandom for the rest of your life, because Paul Thomas Anderson really fancies Lana Haim. Anyway, Licorice Pizza's out on DVD and Blu-ray uh, from Monday. Uh, on streaming uh, from Monday as well, um, on Netflix, in fact, is a movie we both quite liked, I think, didn't we, Max? Mm. Yeah. yeah, and it's, we were just uh, having a little d discussion yeah. off-air about how it got buried just before the pandemic, quite unnecessarily. Uh, it Dave did, Bautista. Didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Dave Bautista stars in this. It's called My Spy. It's available on Netflix, and I think it will have a bit of a resurgence, don't you think? I hope so. I mean, it went to Amazon Prime uh, not long after the first lockdown and then uh, and, and then got sort of shunted out of there. And now it's, now it's coming over to Netflix. Um, this is you know, that obligatory one that every, you know, action star has to do, particularly if they're a wrestler turned action star, which is, okay, right, um, have you done have you done the, the period piece or the sorcery one? Okay, cool, you've done the modern day Black Ops one? Cool, right, um, we've got like a 10 year old girl and a white background, we need you to do some leaning and some kind of comedy, <laughs> some red text, some red or blue text on there, and you're good, you're good. We'll put it out like Thanksgiving weekend and it'll make a few bucks. Uh, if we can scratch 100 mil, we'll call it a win. And yeah, we, then you can tick that one off the box and go and do the franchise one again after that. And this is Dave Bautista's one. So this is Dave Bautista's equivalent to the Game Plan or the John Cena Firehouse one or Vin Diesel's The Pacifier or Suburban Commando. Or, you know, the yeah. one that every single one of them has done. This is Batista's one. He's the CIA agent who teams up with the little girl who may or may not witness some stuff or is going to come into possession of the sensitive data that the bad guys want. You know the movie, right? You, you, yeah. you get the impression. Uh, here's, here's the clip that specifically identifies it as this one. And if you need a, a shorthand, by the way, to identify it as that one, this is the one where they do the Britney car chase. Okay, this is the Britney car chase one with Dave Bautista. It's on Netflix from Monday. Hey, Mom. I was thinking, since you can't take me to Parents and Special Friends Day tomorrow at school, maybe JJ could take me. I don't think that's the best idea. Not the best idea. Why not? Because I'm sure he's very busy. Very busy. He's not. He's unemployed. He just sits around all day watching TVs. Sophie, that's not very nice. No, not nice. It's just everyone else has someone to bring, and you said you can't get out of work, and I'm not going to have anybody. And I'm going to be the only one. Well, like I said, I really enjoyed this. It's got all the laughs in the right place. It's mm. got good performances yeah. there. And it's just really, really enjoyable. So that's My Spy, available on Netflix from Monday. Now, that wraps us up for another week here on Off Offscreen. Uh, next week, though, the big movie out is almost as big as Top Gun Maverick, but not quite. It is oh. Jurassic World Dominion, where the, <laughs> the dinosaurs break out into the real world. It was only a matter of time before that happened. Um, know, they may right? also... Like they may also have put all of the good bits in the trailer just 
judging by what I saw when I went to go and watch <laughs> Top Gun Maverick. But I, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I, I'm waiting for the on-screen explanation as to how the hell they're getting Sam Neill back into any of this. Yeah. Like, why why Ellie Sattler? Like, to be honest with you, that's kind of the big selling point of it is going to be, it, it's the generational thing, it's bringing back the yes. cast, but they're not really selling it on that in the marketing. It's strange, it's just being sold as Jurassic World 3. It's just strange that they're not doing a, you know, Fast Five this time. It's an all-star up there, you know, with uh, X-Men Days of Future Past as well. You know, kind of at this time, we've got your dad's faves back as well. You know, but that's Jurassic World Dominion. We can we can tell you all about it this time. Next week, Miss Perfect, but uh, well, for us now, that's, that's kind of all we've got in the popcorn bucket. For now, I've been Van Connor. And I've been Bex Perfect, and we shall return. <laughs>